This podcast is powered by The Plug. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. I am your host. My name is Jules, and today we're going to talk about sex. If you're listening to this, it's likely that the last time you had sex ed, if you had any, was quite some time ago. So I wanted to take us down um, a little trip of memory lane um, in order to consider the ways in which our sexuality was developed. Um, If you're new here, I recently came out after dating men for a very long time and I had absolutely no idea until this woman came in my life and started attending my events and I just developed such a huge crush and I noticed my face would get so hot when I talked to her and I was so nervous but if you had asked me prior um, if I had ever had interest in women or dated women I had never hooked up with a woman I had never even had like drunk makeouts. Well, I take that back maybe like one, um, but like drunk makeouts with a girl, um, at a club or anything before. And so for me, it came as a huge surprise because I feel that sexual, um, interactions or interactions of a sexual or sensual nature between women, even, um, if one woman identifies as straight are generally written off as like, oh, well, it's not real or they're fetishized. Um, and so I think there, my, po- my point there is that I think there are straight women that have done a lot more lesbian things than I. So it's a huge surprise to me. <laughs> I think I didn't even have friendships that were close enough with women um, that would have been able to show me the potential for any anything beyond just emotional intimacy because I didn't even have that with women, right? So I've been thinking a lot about how sexuality is created within us and how we develop it and the certain influences. And for those of you who are not familiar with me or might be new here, I'm in a graduate program for marriage and family therapy and one of my classes right now is gender and sexuality and so I was really excited when we had class yesterday and it was all about sex and sexuality and so I learned some really important things that I wanted to bring here with you and this is why I have this podcast this is part of decolonizing mental health and wellness is to bring this information a lot of information that's gate kept from the public and kept just within the walls of academia um, and I think that everyone has a right to it so we're going to talk about that today. So Michael Foucault was a French philosopher and historian, and he had this belief that sexuality um, are the activities and sensations determined historically, regionally, and culturally. And so that takes this idea of social constructivism in that like everything that we live in is socially constructed. And it's important for me to communicate with you all that it's really easy to go down this trap of like, oh, well, everything is fake. Everything's a construction, but like, yes. And these constructions have very real implications. Um, so looking at it through that lens, um, and seeing sexuality as contextual, we start to examine how certain influences have influenced our story. So for example, I grew up in the Mormon church. I grew up with a mother from the sixties. I grew up around 2000s American television, music, and media. I was born in North Carolina, so some Southern hospitality um, and like manners uh, or mannerisms, I believe, are, were instilled in me pretty young. Um, and I had a reproduction based sex ed as a kid. So those were my preliminary experiences um, at the time of my development of sexuality. Um, and when I look back at it, There was no emphasis on pleasure, and there was certainly no option for homosexuality. I knew that gay men existed, and my best friend growing up had two moms, and so I knew that lesbian women existed, but um, I wasn't, I wasn't, 
any older than like 14 at that point. So when I think about the development of my sexuality, there was no emphasis on pleasure and there was certainly no option for homosexuality. Yes, I knew that like gay people existed. It, I was in theater and dance. I knew gay men existed, but I don't believe that I had a clear understanding of lesbian relationships or the option um, for women to love one another and to choose that. Uh, I grew up very much with the script of heteronormativity, of financial subordination of women, um, of marriage essentially as a legalized subordination of women. Um, I come from a family where there is a lot of divorce, there are a lot of children, and the men that my, the women in my family have chosen have been great stereotypical financial providers, very gender rolled. Women stayed at home with the kids in addition to having a career. Um, and so that was just what I thought was normal. I thought that was, that was going to be my plan until very recently. Um, and so when I'm looking back at how my sexuality was developed, it, I suppose it isn't surprising to me um, that I didn't see that as an option. I think I adapt to situations very well. And so when you grow up seeing heteronormativity all around you and you know how to adapt to things well, um, you just kind of play the script. And I think I did and I was really good at it until I got to this point where I was like, I was so sick of dating abusive men and I've dated so many I make jokes like I've had the Baskin Robbins spread of abuse and abuse is really tricky because you don't ever see it coming and every time you learn a new red flag they this new party will like hit you with a new one that you didn't even know existed and so you couldn't possibly have looked out for it right um and so being in a, my first queer relationship, things are very different. There's a very different power dynamic between two women. There's a very different sexual chemistry between two women. Um, physically, the uh, I think amount of violence that's involved in heterosexual sex is so common that it's not even, like we don't even think about it. But when I think back on all of my sexual experiences, pain has always been a part of the equation. And I didn't realize that pain didn't need to be a part of the equation until very recently. In fact, I had an experience recently where um, I was having sex with my girlfriend and she asked if something hurt and I said yes and she said, okay, well, let's stop. And he said, well, no, 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 it's okay if you want to continue. And she was like, we're inside of you and it was really emotional because she was totally right and I had never thought twice about it. I was so used to accepting pain even though it was inside of me um, just as part of it and that is deeply saddening to me and I also believe that I am not alone in this experience. And so the fact that this was so normal for me brings up this idea of sexual scripts. And sexual scripts are the roles that we play or the scripts that we follow within sexual interactions. And you know, we have scripts in all sorts of parts of our lives, right? So you have a script when you go into a coffee shop the barista is going to ask you, like, how are you doing? And you're going to say, great, how are you? And they're going to say, great, can you take your order? You, you keep it short, you give your order, and you keep it moving. Like, there's a time and a place for everything. And so I want to point out that there's really helpful scripts sometimes. And in sex, I think it's important minimally to at least understand our scripts. And then if we feel like these aren't in alignment for our, our lives anymore, then we can choose to change them. But we have to have this awareness of them. And so for me, part of my sexual script was like being kind of docile, being dominated, taking whatever pain in the interest of pleasure for the other. Um, and like my pleasure pretty much wasn't important. 
um, or it came afterward. I had no problem telling men if I needed more or if I wanted to use a toy. I was able to have a voice in a in some sorts, um, but it was seemingly absent in others. And I think it's fair to say that part of this comes from my first sexual my first sexual experience being non-consensual. So when your voice is taken from you that young, how do you redevelop it? It's very common for survivors of sexual trauma to continue to seek out situations that are ultimately re-traumatizing in order to help them make sense of it in their head. And I think for me, there was certainly an element of sex with men as self-harm and not that there was awareness around that but again with individuals who adapt to things well i think if you're given this task um, society gives you this task and then something happens when you're doing that task that now takes away your autonomy um, you're going to keep doing your best to figure it out and play that part. And I think that's what I did for a really long time. Um, and so when I was approached by my now girlfriend, um, things were very different and I found myself not playing into a script, even in the courtship stage, even in conversation, even in texting, even in flirting, um, it's just completely different, and I really am not sure that I would have had this enlightenment of the way that my sexual history has been or the way that um, my traumatic sexual experience, my initial sexual experience, has impacted the way I live my life in all aspects and the way I interact with men in all as aspects had I not had this really stark contrast all of that is to say that sexual scripts influence our sexual health and had I not had this opportunity to have a really stark, obvious um, way to face it, stark contrast, um, I probably would not have had that awareness. And so I share this story with you as an invitation. Um, I share this vulnerability with you in order to encourage you to take a moment to consider what type of sexual scripts you might be engaging in. When you think about the ways that you have sex, both with yourself and with others, how does that look? If you were gonna go step by step, you might find that there are some patterns that you follow, whether you're in a relationship or you're exploring sexual relationships with others, um, humans are habitual and we generally like to repeat things um and you know and back to this idea of sexuality being a result of the context with which we grow up in and are living in the sexual script of a gay black man in alabama for example is going to be very different than a sexual script of a heterosexual Asian woman in San Francisco, for example. So um, I invite you to look at yours and see what that looks like. Because where there's awareness that maybe we don't enjoy something or we've been following it just to follow it because that's what we do, um, there's room for expanded pleasure. And that is why I wanted to talk about sex on this episode today. The majority of the sexual education that we have received is always reproductive focused, and that's if we even received any sexual education growing up. Um, and sex is not purely reproductive. Sex is not purely evolutionary. As humans, we are wired for pleasure. And that is really exciting when we can think about the opportunities for expansion of pleasure. And for this conversation, I want us to look at the ways that we can engage in pleasure with ourselves. Early in sex education development, 
there was a woman who proposed the idea of masturbation education as a way to prolong or sort of defer sexual interactions between um, young individuals. And that was very quickly um, shot down just because of the religious atmosphere that we live in and the shame and guilt that exists around sex and specifically masturbation. However, I really think she was onto something because after sitting with Danny and discussing their solo poly life, I started to think about the ways that um, that could apply to one's sex life. What if when we thought of sex life, first and foremost, or sexual health for that matter, we considered ourselves? What if we were our own primary partner and we took care of ourselves by means of masturbation, by means of sensual touch and non-sexual touch, and really had a healthy sex life with ourselves, so much so that anything else that we did with somebody else was just extra, was just abundant was just for pleasure and we took the you know desire to control or manipulate or objectify or be violent with someone out of the equation and I think that might be a really nice way to live I am someone with a really high sex drive I could have sex every day And I realized that for any given partner, maybe that's not fair. (laughs) Maybe that's not fair to put that on them. And I just don't think it is. Like, I wouldn't rely on somebody else to feed me three times a day. I wouldn't rely on somebody else for all of my self-confidence, right? I'm not going to rely on the compliments of one person for my ego to feel good. I'm going to get some from my friends. I'm going to get some from doing well in school. I'm going to get some from teaching and feeling good about myself there. I'm going to get some from the affection of my dog, right? There's all these different avenues that we get, um, you know, validation or self-esteem in. And I find it curious that when it comes to romantic relationships, we tend to dump the responsibility of our sexual health, of our ego, of validation of affection. We put it all in one person. And I think that's very much some of the ideas of this solo poly um, lifestyle that Danny and I spoke about in the last episode. Um, If you haven't listened, I highly recommend heading over and listening to that episode. Um... And so if we, if we look at that with our sexual health, what if we first and foremost relied on ourselves and looked at any other sexual interactions with others as extra? What would that look like? And going back to our sexual scripts, what sort of scripts do we follow even with masturbation? Are we watching the same type of porn? Are we just defaulting to using the toys that we we know gets the job done are we goal oriented are we just looking to come and then move on because that's another thing that I think should be discussed is like orgasm doesn't have to be the end all be all for starters women are multi-orgasmic so the potential to have many is absolutely there and in that same breath there's no need to have any I think for a lot of women they can relate to this idea of foreplay sometimes being the best, most exciting part of sex. Um, There's plenty of studies that demonstrate that ideal sex for a woman has a lot of caressing and kissing and touch um, involved rather than just quickly get into business. So I'll leave you with a little bit of homework this week. I would like you to masturbate, and the next time that you do, I'd like you to do something different. If you usually use porn, maybe just get in front of a mirror instead. If you usually use a toy, maybe just use your hand. If you usually just use your hand, maybe try a toy. Do something explorative and give yourself 30 minutes to an hour to do it. And I know that sounds like a long time. But if you just start with gentle touching on your neck, on your arms, just playing with sensation, noticing, taking an inventory, do I like more intense touch? Do I like pressure versus do I like a softer touch? Do I like to be caressed? Do I like certain fabrics on my skin? 
and just take a moment to play. I think life can get so routine and we have these sexual scripts and it can be really liberating and fun to create a more explorative process with this. Sexual health is incredibly important and I think it can begin with you. And I'm curious about the ways that a self-fulfilled, sexually liberated being might change the way they operate with others in sex. As always, let me know your thoughts. I love getting messages from you all, questions, suggestions. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll talk real soon. Besos. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you or your company are looking to jump into the podcast world, now is the time. The Plug Agency is here to connect you to the full power of podcasting. You just record and leave the rest to us. The people are listening and want to hear from you. Theplug-agency.com. That's theplug-agency.com. Click the link in the episode description for an exclusive offer. The number one selling product of its kind with over 20 years of research and innovation. Botox Cosmetic, out of botulinum toxin A, is a prescription medicine used to temporarily make moderate to severe frown lines, crow's feet, and forehead lines look better in adults. Effects of Botox Cosmetic may spread hours to weeks after injection, causing serious symptoms. Alert your doctor right away as difficulty swallowing, speaking, breathing, eye problems, or muscle weakness may be a sign of a life-threatening condition. Patients with these conditions before injection are at highest risk. Don't receive Botox Cosmetic if you have a skin infection. Side effects may include allergic reactions, injection site pain, headache, eyebrow and eyelid drooping, and eyelid swelling. Allergic reactions can include rash, welts, asthma symptoms, and dizziness. Tell your doctor about medical history, muscle or nerve conditions including ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, myasthenia gravis, or Lambert-Eaton syndrome and medications, including botulinum toxins, as these may increase the risk of serious side effects. For full safety information, visit BotoxCosmetic.com or call 877-351-0300. See for yourself at BotoxCosmetic.com.